I give you Josh Fox. Thanks. Thanks so much, Lois. Um, I, I'm really here because of, of Lois Frank, and, and um, one of those people in the world that you can just never, ever turn down. And I, <laughs> I'm very glad I didn't. Um, the, the, being adopted into the Blood Tribe and meeting with you guys and spending time there uh, two or three years ago was one of the most amazing experiences of my life, and I'm really looking forward to more work. Um, so, uh, be, being, being in Canada, I, I thought it was suitable to do something um, unabashedly American. Can you kind of hear that? Is it coming through? Um, I, I, I didn't plan to do this, but since Maud said she's tore up her speech, you know. Um, I just recently... I had the honor of um, introducing Pete Seeger. It's very, uh, he was playing an anti-fracking concert in upstate New York. Um, and it was a small crowd. And they, they called me up and said, will you introduce Pete Seeger? And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll introduce Pete Seeger. <laughs> and um, I, 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 he's 94 years old, and I got, I got to meet him. Um, he's one of the great authors of... Uh, America, I think, and one of the great authors of, of uh, grassroots awareness all over the world. And, um, and I said, you know, uh, I'm going to introduce you, okay, um, because you taught me so many lessons from afar. You taught me all about how you have to connect the watersheds to the cities when he built the Clearwater and he talked about the Hudson River and, he, and, and we picked up that strand in Gasland when we started talking about the New York City watershed under the threat of frackers and how that would affect the city. And, and, and you know, um, so many, I think my, the first six concerts of my life I saw were Pete Seeger and the seventh was Kiss, you know. <laughs> And, and, I, and I told him all this stuff, and I said, but I was planning on playing something to introduce you, and I, and I told him what I was, what I was going to play. And he said, oh, that's the greatest hit song of 1814. <laughs> and um, as if he was there, you know. And he said, a fellow sung that song in a bar one night, and it was such a hit, he had to sing it twice. And then... Clip-clop, clip-clop, on horseback at four miles an hour, all the way up and down the coast of the United States, it became the most popular song in America. And I'll play it now and see if you can't um, figure it out, what it was. If there's time later, I'll, I'll, do a, I'll do a Scottish one. But the, the interesting thing here, right, was this idea of authorship and of creation. And if a bar song can become the national anthem of the United States of America, 
Yeah, it's my own rendition. <laughs> Play ball. It, then we're really just making it all up as we go along, right? And that that is the power of how things move from person to person in a grassroots way. And I thought that that was an amazing thing to think about. The, one of the great authors of America and of the grassroots idea, Pete Seeger, talking to me about how we're actually in charge of writing the next great chapter of all of this. And that you never know how what you do in a bar one night <laughs> or in a room like this um, will end up a couple hundred years from now um, as the pillar of, of that civilization. So, you know, I, I don't know how many of you have seen the, either one of the films, but you probably know, you know, that in 2008, the natural gas industry knocked on my door um, in the Upper Delaware River Basin, uh, part of the watershed for New York City, uh, New Jersey, and Philadelphia. Altogether, about 16 million people get clean drinking water from the area where I live and asked if we, could, if we would lease our 20 acres um, for this thing that nobody had ever heard of. Uh, you know the word. It, it's, it's, it begins with an F, and it's, and it's just like it sounds. Um, to frack. And I you know, had no idea what was going on. And all of a sudden I started hearing about these chemicals and about these five-acre pad sites and thousands of truck trips. And I read about... Uh, a person named Jessica Ernst in Alberta who could light her water on fire. Um, and I, 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 I tell you, I, I couldn't sleep for three weeks. I never felt more lonely or depressed or scared or isolated in, in my entire life at the, than at that time. Then we could see, in, not just in my lifetime, but in a very short period of time, a rapid industrialization of the Delaware River Basin. Um, so I went out to try to find a way to tell the story of what was happening with this thing called fracking all across the United States and traveled, um, I don't know, uh, 20 or so odd states and filmed in 12 of them. And everywhere I went, it was the same story. Water contamination, air pollution, a health crisis, a sense that the fabric of life had completely dissolved and had um, that the, the, the integrity and character of the areas that people had, had um, lived in uh, have been destroyed. Whether I was in Pennsylvania or Colorado or Wyoming or New Mexico uh, or Louisiana, um, it was the same story. But what I really, and I think, I think there's really power, power in telling individual stories that are representative of thousands or millions of people. I, and I want to talk about grassroots because, you know, I have toured with the first movie, Gasland 1, to 250 cities. Even though it was on HBO in America and in Canada and it reached an audience of millions and it went to 30-odd countries to an audience of probably about 50 million people, I wanted to go tour because I wanted to go talk and I wanted to meet with people and talk about what this was about and why this was important. Um, and I've now toured with Gasland 2 to 45 cities um, in uh, North America and in Europe. And I've witnessed this movement. It's astounding. It's incredible. When you have 800 people in Ithaca, 900 people in Binghamton, 1,700 people in Pittsburgh for one night for a movie screening, um, 650 in Santa Cruz, and this goes on and on and on. You see that this is an incredibly strong movement of people who are bound together, who are concerned, who are fighting like hell. And, you know, I was just uh, in London addressing a conference of the oil and gas industry. <laughs> of the oil and gas industry. The Financial Times um, invited me to take part in a forum. And I, went, and I said yes, because I knew the gas industry would be there. And I never get invited into those rooms. <laughs> you know. and, and the first question was... Why is there such a big movement on fracking? And I said, you know, let me tell you the story of uh, Guy, Arkansas. They have injection wells and fracking. They had 1,000 earthquakes in a year. I, I met a woman who was a dog breeder. Her name was Susan Fry. She had 100 of these little black 
pure breed snowflake dogs running around back behind her house. And she became so obsessed with tracking earthquakes that she had a, a plum bob attached to the bottom of her coffee table. And every time the plum bob moved, she would go on the earthquake tracking sites and say, see, there was another earthquake. And she would sit there all day watching this thing go back and forth. So most of those quakes were small. They were microquakes. But then a 4.7 hit, put cracks in the walls of the local high school, and knocked the earthquake lady's husband out of his lazy boy. <laughs> and, and I imagine that as he hit the ground, you know, something happened to him. Or I was telling the guest, or I should tell you a story of Amy Ellsworth in uh, Colorado in the front range of, outside of Denver, whose tap water was so flammable that she could light it on fire at the tap. And, and that she was showering in the dark because she was afraid of a spark from her light bulb would blow her up in her shower. And I imagine that when she was standing there, you know, naked, dripping, fumbling for a towel in the dark, that something uh, happened to her. And I, I can tell you the story of the G family in, in, in uh, Tioga County, Pennsylvania. S Shell Oil Company installed a six, well, horizontal pad about 250 feet, 200 feet from their bedroom window. Their water became flammable. Their pond became contaminated with all the frack runoff and was uh, dying. And they um, were forced to move out of that house that they'd lived in for five generations, or they had been on that land for five generations, and sign a non-disclosure agreement, um, never to tell their stories ever again. Thankfully, there, it is in Gasland, too. But I imagine as they walked away from that home and shut the door and realized that they didn't need to lock it, you know, something happened to them. Or Lois, standing there in front of those trucks, the police commissioner, <laughs> about to be arrested. That continuing spirit of, of activism. Or the... Uh, New Orleans fisherman that I just met three weeks ago who said, my oyster catch is down in the Gulf of Mexico. My oyster catch is down 94%. I'm out of business. At 57 years old, I'm going back to school. And I imagine sitting, him sitting there in the first class, you know, with the Gulf waters still rocking inside of him, that something probably happened to him. I could tell you a hundred stories. Uh, maybe more, all of whom emblematic of what's happening all across the world, what's happening all across certainly North America, but all across the world, that we are being invaded by this thing called extreme energy. Right? Extreme energy is extremism <laughs> from the oil and gas industry. When we have... When we, when we have... Drilling and fracking in 34 states in the U.S., and I don't know how many provinces here, but probably a lot, and in 32 countries worldwide, the proposals to frack. When we have frack sand mining um, blowing off the tops of bluffs in, all, in a handful of states where there is no fracking. We have deep water drilling in the Gulf of Mexico, mountaintop removal for coal throughout Appalachia. The Keystone Pipeline, as you know, proposed to run like a scar that won't heal right down the middle of the United States of America. And when we have superstorms emptying the Atlantic Ocean into the New York City subway system or swamping whole towns in Vermont, 100-year-old bridges wa washing away in the blink of an eye, when we have typhoon after typhoon in the Philippines, historic floods in Pakistan and Australia, I could go on and on and on. There is no one outside of this target zone. There is no one who is not in the front line. We are now graduated. We're all in that front line community. Extreme energy is a paradigm shift in energy development. Conventional oil, coal, and gas developed the world for the last 200 years. That supply is running out. 
So the oil and gas industry has shifted to unconventional sources. I like to call that extreme energy, right? Tar sands, which scrapes off the entire surface of the earth. The target is, uh, one of the targets is the boreal forest in Canada, the size of the uh, state of Florida, or the, uh, you know how big it is. I don't have to use the metaphor, you're in ca Canadians. <laughs> I, fracking, which injects toxic material down in the ground at pressures that rival cluster bombs with wells that crack and leak that we know, according to oil and gas industry's own literature and own science, leak at a rate of 5% immediately upon drilling and up to 50 to 60% over a 30-year period. Mountaintop removal for coal, where for once they didn't use the euphemism, they just blow off the top of the mountain. And deep water drilling. Probably you don't know, but the deep water horizon that exploded was drilling down nearly five miles. It was one of 12 that far out on the outer continental shelf. It was a brand new technology. Extreme energy is not like, uh, it's like you ski down a normal slope. Extreme skiing, you know, when everybody cracks their head open, it's like skiing straight down the Empire State Building. We know that extreme energy is much more toxic, much more destructive. Um, it's inherently toxic and destructive. And that's what we're shifting, the oil and gas industry and coal industry would, would like the world to shift to that paradigm of extreme energy. And that means that we're experiencing the type of uh, invasion of these companies, these multinational oil and gas companies, the most powerful, profitable corporations in the history of money at so many of our doorsteps. And as they ratchet this plan up to, to keep us addicted to fossil fuels for the next 50 or 60 years, the huge and grave mounting threat of global climate change, we know we have to solve that problem in much less time. So the paradigm is extreme energy or what the grassroots movement that's all over the world wants, which is renewable energy. The good news, the good news, the good news is that, um, you know, renewable energy can run everything that we, that we have a, a, a need for on the planet. We can replace all of our fossil fuel sources with renewables. Um, we have enough wind on the planet to power the earth seven times over. Solar is something like 30 times. Mark Jacobson, the brilliant energy planner from uh, Stanford, has written these plans to show how we can get off of fossil fuels and do it in a hurry. So there is no necessity for this extreme energy movement, this extremism from the oil and gas industry, other than their own profit motive. It has nothing to do with um, energy development for humankind. It's actually quite the opposite. But there's another form of contamination due to fracking that I want to talk about and I want to point out, which is the contamination of our forms of democratic government. Though it's, you know, at the end of Gasland 2, I used a metaphor. It's like I could see a well bore, you know, snaking down underneath the United States Congress and shooting money up through the chamber at such high pressure that it blew the top off of the democracy. And it's not just the money. $747 million spent in the United States uh, on lobbying to reverse the exempt, to, to, to exempt fracking from our Safe Drinking Water Act, our primary groundwater protection law, they're exempt. It cost them three quarters of a billion dollars. But it's way beyond that. It's the influence that they have at our state regulatory commissions within elections at the state level and within the Congress. When I asked Brad Miller, congressman from North Carolina, uh, our first question um, in my interview for him uh, in Gas Night 2, I said, tell me about the influence of oil and gas on Congress. And he goes, influence? Try ownership. And I said, would you care to elaborate on that? And he goes, are we rolling? <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> the contamination of our forms of democracy by this industry and the contamination of our media. In your paper today, there's a letter to the editor challenging the op-ed that Maud and I co-wrote co called Celebrate Fracking in which they state there hasn't been a single 
episode of water contamination due to fracking. It's printed in the paper. I want everybody in this room to call those editors tomorrow and say, how dare you? The Los Angeles Times will not print letters that feature climate change denialism. You shouldn't have a hometown paper here that pr prints fracking denialism. It's not worth printing. So I'm witnessing this incredibly diverse and awesome and beautiful grassroots movement that I'm in awe of every day with so many different types of strategies from you know, your citizen lobbying, going to the Capitol, to petition drives, to awareness drives, to bootleg copies of Gasland and hand them out to all your neighbors, <laughs> to, you know, knocking on people's doors, because this is a movement of neighbors, um, to that communication on the social media, and I think also vitally important, um, as it is to every grassroots movement that's ever succeeded, direct action and, and nonviolent civil disobedience. And when I, I was just in, in Balcom, um, where they had a standoff against the police for, uh, um, I think, two months, um, in which they experienced a whole lot of police brutality. And I met a guy named Tigger who had de-locked himself to one of the pieces of equipment. Um, and he described that he was wailed upon by the police and the rage that, that he felt, and watching people who were pepper sprayed. Um, it, it, it's just mind-boggling to me that we have now institutionalized, uh, to a certain degree, pepper spray as a, a tactic for protesters, that that's okay. I can thank Mayor Mike Bloomberg, uh, billionaire Mayor Mike Bloomberg, whose friends finance fracking, for deploying that and dispersing Occupy, um, but it occurs to me, and, and when I saw um, the pictures from New Brunswick, I, 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 my, my jaw was on the floor. We were on tour. I was in Detroit. I saw this incredible photograph of a woman with an eagle feather standing in front of a line of police. And I saw uh, snipers, military snipers in the bushes, and heard that they had been fired upon with rubber bullets and high-pressure hoses. And they sent 700 members of the police or military to a town of 818 people. That this was an insane and overzealous reaction to a peaceful protest. And it shows that there's an institutional level of racism within the RCMP. And who, who, because I don't think, I don't think, I don't think it would have happened that way if this was a bunch of white grandmas out in the streets, you know. I really don't think it would have happened in the same way. I really think that there's a, a ratcheting up of brutality because this was a First Nations gathering that has to be called out for what it was. But I also, I also have to make a plea for nonviolent um, reactions to that type of repression. I, I have to say that it is so important for us to remain nonviolent. I walked over to the shopping mall this afternoon and I was completely amazed that there's a statue of Mahatma Gandhi <laughs> just down the road. It's a huge statue. And it said underneath the picture, the bronze head of Gandhi in Saskatoon, <laughs> nonviolence is a universal law. That's what it says. And, and as hard as it is and as understandable as it is, and who knows what really happened, right? You know, we can't be lighting cop cars on fire. I just don't think we can. Unless we want to suffer that type of media uh, degradation that happened afterwards. And we have to embrace principles of nonviolence. And I would say... Even if, and there have, been, there have been instances of infiltration, we know of this, and of provo 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 provocateurs who go in and pose as protesters, and I don't know exactly what happened over there, but you do know there's a history of that. But I would call upon us as a movement, as a grassroots movement of considerable power, that we have to recognize our power and not sink 
to that level because we are much more powerful if we remain nonviolent. And, and, and I would say um, that we should take preemptive measures against sabotage in the future by, by signing a declaration of nonviolence before we do the blockade, by, leave, by leaving the violence to those people who would come in with snipers and rubber bullets, and by stating at the outset, we will have none of this. Because then, if you put that out there, in writing, in the paper, then it will be, there will be no justification whatsoever for sending in, in anyone's mind. Not that there is. But do you understand how we can undercut that? Because I'm very afraid of this. I'm watching this as a person who's, in many ways, um, you know, responsible for supplying a lot of the storytelling and the images. And I say to myself, we have to make sure that we're trained in doing it in, 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 the, in the ways that we don't fight back. We're fighting back in other ways. So, and I think that, you know, what that means to me is oil and gas industry is knowingly deceitful. We, they're knowingly deceitful. Their tactics are deceitful. They're aggressive. They lie to the media. They lie to our reporters. But in the face of their deceitful practice and in the face of their misinformation campaigns, I would say we, we have to reaffirm honesty. And in the face of their trampling of people's human rights, as happens all over where this industry goes, I, I think we have to reaffirm the idea of decency and neighborliness. And in the face of fragmentation of communities, I'd say we have to reaffirm the idea of trust. And in the face of their greed, I would say we have to reaffirm our ideas of kindness. Because those are the tests that they fail over and over and over again. They can be exempt from the Safe Drinking Water Act. They can be exempt from the Clean Water Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, the, the Superfund Act, the Clean Air Act. But you cannot be exempt from the basic laws, moral laws of human kindness, human decency, and trust. You can't. And they are guilty of violating those laws. So I take an enormous amount of, of uh, inspiration and, and hope from this grassroots movement. And it is powerful. And I would say that if you look at it on the local level, you have thousands of people affected. If you look at it on the countywide level, you have hundreds of thousands. When you look at it at a regional level, you have millions of people affected, right? Whether it's regional air pollution and smog or the, the downstream communities outside of the frac zone that are going to be contaminated. But if you look at it from the global climate change level, it's billions of people that are affected. And it is us who, is, who are in the target zone in our own backyards that have the responsibility of acting right now because we have this catalyst that came to our neighborhood that's called extreme energy. And it has pushed us forward and pushed us into a totally new kind of consciousness. It's an extreme and, an, and it's an emergency. We hit two degrees of warming by 2042 at current emissions levels. That means we lose, according to IPCC, one quarter to 30% of all the plant and animal species on the planet. That's a lot of goodbyes. It also probably means the coll collapse of our industrial civilization. We don't have a lot of time. So it is this grassroots that is going to stand up and, and, and get in the way of that extreme energy. Um, and I have an enormous amount of faith in it, and I'm very excited about the future because it has led us to so many amazing meetings of people. Um, and, I, and I hope that you continue to participate in it, and I hope that you have fun with it. And because what we're doing here is building that sense of honesty and community together. Um, and there's nothing more important and more valuable to do in life that I, I've ever experienced. So, thank you. <laughs>